Do we have any questions? I read your book, Boy Benson, a very fine book. I certainly recommend it to anybody here. But uh, towards the end of the book, I didn't remember too much of how you uh, educated yourself and how you became a successful uh, professional businessman. <laughs> Well, um, of course, I, I totally lost my education uh, because when in 1941 uh, the, the Jewish Codex came out, uh, one of the places there was that we were not allowed to go uh, to uh, national school. We were kicked out of the school because we were Jewish. I went into the I went uh, to a Jewish school in the neighboring town, but of course uh, the deportation started uh, in March 1942. Our teacher, they were young Jewish men and women, and they were arrested and taken away. So my education ended, and uh, I began to go to school again towards the end of uh, uh, 1945, beginning of 1946. I never forget that time because I had to, I was at the time 10 year old and I had to sit with six, seven year old children because I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't do any mathematics. After the school, the other children went out uh, playing football and enjoying themselves. I sat over the books and I had to learn because I wanted to catch up my own age. You can only imagine the children, they bullied me in the school because they could not understand how a 10 year old can read and write. They thought I'm so stupid that so I had tough time even going to school in Slovakia. But eventually uh, I, I continue my study. It took me two years before I uh, caught up with my own age and eventually I went to college and finally I studied in Germany of all places because I wanted to become an uh, engineer and I qualified as a diploma engineer. Uh, so in the end uh, I didn't do badly, I became a businessman and uh, uh, I didn't do badly uh, altogether. And, uh, I retired uh, when, when my wife, wife passed away uh, in, 19, uh, in 2003 um, because I, I, I just didn't see any point working for somebody else I didn't need, need anymore and uh, met Joyce in 2006. Yeah, I have to be careful not to make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm very lucky. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you ended up in Ireland. What? How did you end up here? Well, that, that's, um, you know, 99% of the question that I get, it's that question. How did I come to... Ireland, and I always say that uh, if I have to tell you how I come here, you will be sitting here another hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, well, if you want to know, buy my book. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just in a short way, I, I was studying in uh, Germany, and um, <coughs> a gentleman, an industrialist in England, he was looking for uh, somebody to set up a factory here in Ireland. I didn't know about Ireland at the time. I thought it was England. But anyway, <laughs> I got a letter from this gentleman and uh, he said, look, come to um, London. I have a proposition to you. And if you like it, we can make business. If you don't like it, you will have a holiday on my account. I was at the time 24 year old. So I said to myself, why not? I will see London. And I went, but within uh, three days, 
we signed a contract that I will come to Ireland and set up a factory uh, to manufacture zips. Now I am not an expert in man or I wasn't expert in zips at the time, I was an engineer. So he sent me to Italy uh, where we were buying the equipment and um, the machinery to manufacture it and then I come to Ireland and I set up uh, the factory. I didn't speak at the time English, so uh, I learned English very, very quickly because nobody spoke any other language here, <laughs> only English. And uh, I had to put uh, men and women to work, I had to explain how to do it and what to do. So I, within three months I, I was able to uh, speak a little bit. And uh, while I was setting up the factory, uh, I met a nice Jewish girl, Ivan Blackman, and we fell in love and we got married and I'm still here today. <laughs> An Irish citizen. An Irish citizen, as well. Okay, I'm long enough here to be an Irish citizen. Tommy. Uh, you mentioned your father jumping out of the moving train. Did you ever meet him again? Yeah, well, after the war, uh, we, did, we didn't know about my father, what happened to him and what, where he was. And of course my father didn't know anything about us. And um, at the time, the, when the camp was liberated, uh, the first unit that came in was, of course, the Red Cross. But not only they looked after the sick, they also took a list of the survivors in the camps all over Germany and Poland. And the different uh, 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 people from different countries, the list of these people was put, uh, for example, Polish, it was in Warsaw, the Hungarian in Budapest, uh, Czech and Slovak in Prague. On the uh, Red Cross building, they put the list of the survivor of the particular country. And uh, my uh, uncle, one of the uncles, he was a lawyer, he survived in Slovakia by ha ha uh, hiding and uh, survived the war. So we, uh, over 40 were taken away from our family. So he traveled to, uh, uh, to Prague to see this list, who survived from the family. Immediately when they notified that there is a list, you can see who survived. So it must have been, I mean, we were liberated in April. The war ended in May, so it must have been sometime in May that these lists were put on the uh, building and uh, he then went to the different camp and uh, looking on the list if he could find uh, some uh, people from the family that were taken away. Unfortunately only uh, five of us in Bergen Belsen and one in Buchenwald survived out of the 40 that were taken away. And when he came to the list of Bergen Belsen, which I propose, I have the copy of that list, and uh, he was going to the name, suddenly he saw Judith Reichenthal, Miklos Reichenthal, and Tommy Reichenthal, and of course also my cousin, my, my aunt, <coughs> uh, they were on that list, and he told to my father, you uh, family survived in Belgian Belsen. And uh, of course there was no normal post at the time. So he just took a um, uh, postcard and he wrote Judith Reichenthal, Belgian Belsen, Germany. Because that's all what he knew. Now in Belgian Belsen nobody knew where anybody lived either. So there was a big uh, displaced uh, board that any post that came to Belgium Belgium, they pinned onto this <coughs> notice board. And we used to go every day to look if anybody uh, wrote us, and I never forget the, the thing that was happening, because many 
people discovered somebody uh, that uh, was the loved one that survived and they were very happy and thing. But we also saw many times people in tears and crying. They discovered uh, their hurts and uh, they found a post that uh, their uh, loved one uh, didn't survive. And uh, one day, it must have been end of May or maybe uh, end of, uh, yeah, end of May uh, or, or sometime in June, we found uh, this uh, postcard to the Trikanta and we looked on the back and my father said, I'm home, I'm waiting for you. That's how we found out that my father is alive. But uh, it took a couple of months still because they kept us in quarantine. There, there was disease, a typhoid, typhus and uh, diphtheria, tuberculosis. They didn't want to let us out because they were afraid that we might spread the disease among the civilian population. So we were there till uh, sometime uh, <coughs> towards the end of June. Uh, so we were reunited with my father end of June or beginning of July of 1945. Any question? Sorry, how did that make you feel to be still in the camp when you were liberated as such? Well, we were, we were clearly told. First of all, we didn't stay in the camp because uh, the camp was infested with lice. Mm. And the lice were the reason that the, the disease, the typhus, was spreading. And I mean, when we talking about lice, and I'm sure many here have experienced that a child in the school, they find one, and the school closes because of the <laughs> horrific thing, or the class it closes and horrific. We used to sit like monkeys and just get me at, uh, from our head. They were crawling over us, and our huts were wooden huts. So in the corner of the hut, we used to see them in a row, like an army marching of lights. I mean, just horrific. So when we were liberated, they didn't know what to do about these lights. We were transferred, um, I was transferred to a hospital because I was in a very bad shape. I was like a skeleton. And um, at the time, I needed some pickup, and uh, they decided to send me to hospital. But there was nothing wrong with me. I didn't have typhus or anything, but to go to hospital. I was just skin and bone. If we were not liberated at the time that we were, I don't know how many weeks I would have uh, survived, maybe several weeks, maybe a couple of months, but I would have uh, died as well. And uh, the, all the inmates were transferred uh, to a military camp that belonged to the German army. And they burned Bergen-Belsen to the ground because of these lies. They didn't want it that it get out. So the decision was to burn it down. So unfortunately today in Bergen-Belsen there is nothing. There is a beautiful museum and a teaching center and I was there, I know exactly where my hut stood, I know the number, so I went there and I, I was able to even stand where my bed was, which was, uh, I remember the first time when I went there, I just was in tears when I stood where actually my bed was uh, during the incarceration. But there's the mountains of graves there as well. And of course, if you go to Belgian Belsen, you see the mount of the, where they buried the thing, 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 5,000, only tens of thousands are buried in Belgian Belsen. How did you not become bitter with all the terrible things that Sorry? happened to you? How did you not become bitter with all the terrible things that happened to you? Yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's a deliberate uh, decision. 
Uh, first of all, I, I uh, didn't speak about my experience here for 60 years to nobody. I never told anybody that uh, I was in constant. I, I said that I'm a Holocaust survivor. Uh, my wife, Ivan, uh, she died in 2003. I never told her either. She died without knowing uh, what I went through. She only knew that I was a, a Holocaust survivor. Um, I started to speak around uh, 2005, uh, and that was also very difficult. But um, I'm now speaking uh, off a lot, uh, every week. I'm speaking tomorrow, I'm speaking after tomorrow, I spoke last uh, week, I was in Northern Ireland. So, um, now everybody wants a piece of me, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, as I say, uh, I was never, for 60 years I didn't speak, but uh, now that nobody can stop me speaking. <laughs> but the your question is why I don't say, uh, well I have several proverbs, and one of these proverbs is, make peace with the past, so it doesn't spoil your present. And that's what I did. I made peace with my past. I wanted to make a guard that uh, murdered two people. We made a film about it. I don't know, some of you might have uh, seen it, uh, uh, called Close to Evil. And uh, I, I wanted to meet her. I wanted to make a reconciliation with her. Because not everything is black and white. It might be naivety from me. But I sometimes think this, uh, this woman and this particular woman that I wanted to meet, that when I found out her background and everything, she, she wasn't a very smart person. She missed a lot of uh, school. She had no uh, family life. Her mother was a, a drunkard. Her father was a drunkard. She was brought up more or less by her grandmother. And eventually she volunteered to the SS and here suddenly uh, she is this uh, person with this power in hand that she can tell other people what to do and thing. And she did awful thing. And uh, I feel in a way that she's a victim as well of her time. Uh, from the age of 12 she was indoctrinated uh, what she did uh, up to her age, she was 22, 23 years old. She's still alive today, she's 96 years old. And uh, she thought um, she, it was right what she did. What the disappointment I got was, of course, when I wanted to meet her, and uh, initially she agreed to meet me, and in the last moment, she didn't want to meet me. And the way she spoke and the way she gave testimonies to, to various uh, students, she gave testimony, she gave testimony in, uh, in Belgian Belsen Archive, to the Belgian Belsen Archive, which I got, uh, I translated from German to English, and everything she was talking about were all lies, and uh, that was my disappointment that she is still today a denier of the Holocaust. And I thought at least if I meet her, she will in some way apologize or she will say, I regret what happened at the time. But this I had to do it herself. But she just said, I don't remember, I didn't see, I didn't smell. And uh, when they're talking about the dead bodies in the <coughs> Belgian Belsen, that she claimed uh, that they ask her in Belgian Belsen archive, they ask her, uh, you didn't see this body, there were 20,000 of them. I don't know why Kramer, Joseph Kramer brought them to the camp. In other words, what she claimed, they didn't die there, he brought them in. Up, up to a point like, this 
that thing. I didn't want to that she stand trial or anything, but it was a German historian uh, that brought a case against her. And uh, her file is still open, but we doubt if she will ever stand trial. Uh, I would like that she stand trial, but not uh, to get a punishment, uh, but more to uh, to, uh, to say that what she gave uh, uh, testimony and that that is uh, denied. Uh, if that comes from the trial, would be enough for me, uh, because unfortunately her testimony in the next 50, 60 years, somebody might study the Holocaust and they might take what she said for truth. So that would be important if that was uh, denied. But it's very little chance that it will happen. Thank you very much. Um, President, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'll explain as I get on why I'm here. Um, uh, Tommy, Joyce, and of course Michael Sheen for this wonderful gift that you've given us. Um, your uh, testimony is so moving and so chilling and so insidious. And uh, you've placed it in the modern world, so it is history, but it's very relevant uh, history. Um, we know an awful lot about adverse childhood experiences, and uh, I haven't heard anybody's childhood experience being so adverse. Mm -hmm. And the triumph, as uh, somebody asked the question, the triumph of your spirit over what you've suffered uh, is truly remarkable. Uh, it is quite truly remarkable that you haven't been uh, trapped by what is insurmountable to most people. Um, So getting a packed house in Edmundstown on a wintry evening <laughs> is difficult. And, uh, it's a great tribute to yourself and to the interest. There's a phenomenal interest in Edmundstown in history because we've had another uh, history evening about the foundation of the club, uh, which uh, was again a remarkable evening. Um, and I think because the Holocaust is such a terrible part of European history, it needs the story to bring it to life. It needs the smells, it needs the description, it needs everything like that to bring it to life for us. I've been asked to thank you because Pat Conway found out that I have joined the board of the Holocaust Education Trust only last week, but he found out very quickly. So <laughs> that's why I, and I'm taking over from Dr. Tim O'Connor, whom you know, uh, who has done sterling work with the Trust. And the Trust seeks to educate and inform people about the Holocaust and as part of an international alliance on Holocaust remembrance. And again, you've adopted an educational uh, approach to your experience, which I think is very important because Tommy is one of two survivors of the Holocaust in Ireland and he visits uh, schools in the transition year and leaving search year uh, to tell them about what he does. And I want to, it's, it's interesting, you concluded by uh, a poem, and I'm sure you know this one. Uh, that's the only way I could think of uh, concluding this. Uh, it's a, a poetic form of a, a post-war confession made in German by a Lutheran pastor uh, called Martin Niemann. So you know it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's about the cowardice, really, of German intellectuals and certain clergy, including Niemann himself, uh, following the Nazis' rise to power and the subsequent incremental purging of chosen targets. This was, again, it was chosen targets, um, group after group. And the title of it is, Then They Came For Me. Mm -hmm. 
First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And there have been many variations and adaptations of this uh, original piece um, published in the English language. And all the variations deal with themes of persecution, guilt, repentance, and responsibility. And I thought it was a very powerful way to end this wonderful evening. So I now want to call on our President Mary to make a small presentation to you. Joyce has a little sort of a dish where she put chocolate. Now she can <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy. We all enjoyed this tonight very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending at Safe Home. <laughs> If anybody wants a book, I, I will be signing them. So. Mm. <laughs>